Okay, so I am proud to <laughs> introduce today's guest speaker, Sam Gantus. Gantus uh, is, and he's a graduate, listen, listen to me, a graduate of MIT's Master's of Architecture program. Uh, he's taught at MIT and Cornell AAP, which is where we met this past fall, which is almost going to be a year, and time is moving very quickly. It's pretty crazy. Um, in uh, 2019, Sam co-founded Foreign Objects, along with Agnes Fury Cameron, uh, Kali Redzepi, Gary Zashi Zhang, and um, Foreign Objects is a multi multidisciplinary design and research studio uh, that explores the internet through the production of cultural artifacts. So you should check up check out their website. Um, Sam's work uh, does solo work in architecture as well. Um, and it's also exhibited at uh, EVA Gallery in Manhattan. Uh, and Sam is currently in his homeland of Canada, I believe. It's, it's debatable if it's my homeland. I sort of uh, moved around growing up. I grew up in maybe six or seven cities around the world, but sort of landed here. Which cities were those? State. Sorry? Which cities were those? Oh, I was born in Muscat in Oman, okay. uh, and then I moved to Danbury, Connecticut. <laughs> and then the place I lived the longest was Athens in Greece, then Cairo in Egypt. Uh, then I moved to the suburbs of Toronto for the first time, then to Dubai, the Emirates, then back to the suburbs of Toronto, then Toronto, then Austin, Ithaca, Brooklyn, now back in Toronto. Wow. As of the last month or so. So it's a pretty recent... We're in, a, we're in a furnished apartment at the moment. Um, exciting. So moving, uh, you're used to it at least, I guess, but probably over it at some point. I was just saying this recently to a friend of mine that I really would like my next move to not uh, to last longer than six months. Um, anywho, Sam, you're here to talk to us about your thesis project. So do you want to give us a brief, I mean, you have a slideshow. Yeah. Um, and you could give us a brief introduction to it. And then maybe we'll go from there. I guess our first question is kind of, which you can maybe talk to as you're pulling it up, uh, what the climate of MIT was at the time. And actually, what what year did you graduate? Twenty. 2016-17. Okay. 2017 officially. Um, anyway, before I start though, I wanted to say thank you for inviting me. I feel very honored to be here. And this is sort of exciting uh, setup that you have. I really appreciate that you're trying to make um, space for conversation. Uh, and it's a time when it's hard. And I'm curious to see who else you'll invite because the sort of range of uh, people you've invited have been quite great. And so I appreciate that. Uh, and so this project, I'll say, yeah, it, started, it was in 2016. So it was quite a while back. And Mark and Lucas asked me to share a project that was important to me. And so I see this one as where a lot of things I've done since have started. And that's why I want to share it in all its sort of shortcomings and dead ends uh, and, and sort of messiness as a thesis project, but also that's something that lived on afterwards in other capacities. And so I think that also might open up space for certain conversations if that's relevant. Um, and our, maybe I'll get to your question later, Mark, and I'll just start here. This, uh, I'm gonna give a sort of snippet of a video that might introduce part of the mood of the project sort of as a manifesto and give a sort of informal sort of uh, traversing of other parts of the project after that. Um, so. I'm not going to do like presenter mode or anything. I'm just going to stay in here. We can do it informally. Perfect. Tweeting from your couch in your sweats can be an architectural act. Architecture's ability to serve and shape a public has been weakened by its disciplinary exclusivity and the privatization of public space. Hope for architecture today is found, instead, in its ability to be shared online. There, its value is in its newfound velocity, intensity, and spread. 
an ability to get around. Attention is a currency, and the image, a visual bite that circulates, has already replaced the building in space as such. Architecture is on, and it is, of the web, and it can shape public there. Okay, so that's just a short snippet of uh, that video that hopefully sets the tone for what is a project effectively about uh, architecture in the climate of a sort of uh, banal experience of the internet. It's no longer the sort of space of democracy that uh, holds all the potential and freedom that one might have wanted uh, 20 or 30 years ago, but instead is this sort of thing that we do casually all the time, everywhere. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the sort of focus then is the ways that images participate, uh, images of architecture participate online to sort of form our impressions of the built environment or even displace and replace uh, immediate experience uh, far more frequently through experiences them, experiencing them as images, whether that's videos or JPEGs or drawings or websites or um, blogs, right? And so my response to this, where all of the, the response for this project starts is around a Twitter bot. And I'm gonna, I can play this in the background. I don't think it has any audio, uh, but you'll start to see that uh, this Twitter bot uh, there's this list of models that I've collected online of built works from the last century um, that people online have made, sort of these anonymous creators, amateurs in most part. And this Twitter bot, if you give it these tags that have given uh, for each of these buildings, will send you an image back, a sort of resultant image that recombines your tour through these architectures or these uh, images of architecture as a new one, a sort of making a new from a body of online content. Uh, in a way, highlighting the way things, uh, the way that we interact with images casually, but hopefully also uh, broadening that such that we're not just passive consumers, but maybe someone, whether they're architect or not, could uh, participate a little more in that experience. So here's some more images of that bot. Uh, and the resultant works are these sort of monsters, these tweets that are more images than sincere proposals about the built, built environment that hopefully transcend somewhere between like recognizability and uh, new possibilities and, and maybe also conversation starters. But the hope is that they sort of circulate, right? They hope they get around uh, and they participate in this network of, of um, shared architectural images. And, and this happens at Set in several venues, right? So Twitter is one, you get an image back if you tweet at it. But that tweet that you make also becomes a 3D model that gets uploaded, it goes to Pinterest, gets listed on Shopify to be uh, potentially bought as a 3D print. So it tries to have lives in these different places and uh, spread its sort of impact. So if, uh, I do wanna go back though, because I realize I overlooked something. The claim that architecture is images is not all that new, I would say. Um, you know, architects have had a long relationship with uh, media, right? When I think of Alberti and the relationship to drawing as a contract, uh, or ways that photographs sort of uh, constructed uh, an image of modernity uh, without necessarily us having to experience those buildings. In fact, if you think of uh, probably many canonical buildings, you know them through their images more than through your experience of those images. Um, I guess the difference is the way those were spread before or the way they're spread now has changed or there's a new sort of player in that game. It's the web. Uh, it changes the sort of intensity, velocity, and spread of uh, architecture as media. And so there were two instantiations of this project and as Mark revealed, uh, and we're gonna be sort of candid about it, it was a thesis uh project and this was its first instantiation and so uh, instead of a review it was more of a situation right the sort of line between the critique and real life was blurred as much as possible and we invited reviewers uh into what i call the living room um and in this living room there's a bunch of people quote unquote working they're they're on their laptops on their phones tweeting uh to arc mixes and eating pizza a sort of uh, new casual way of making architectural images. And we asked that um, 
the participants or the reviewers actually partake in this process. So rather than just uh, review a work or receive a work, uh, they have to produce in that space. In that space are also these sort of other uh, tchotchkes, these other everyday things. So as a living room, this shelving unit had, you know, 3D printers making more of these live, but also old prints that end up being kind of like tchotchkes amongst the everyday clutter of everyday life. And that's what these look like. And so the, these images are becoming other things, but effectively becoming images again, as you see on your screen now, and this constant sort of motion. And the second instantiation of the project, as uh, Mark was sort of suggesting, was uh, it's, uh, it was installed at Evian Gallery, which is conveniently for me a loft. Right? It's uh, their actual loft. And so I sort of intervened in the way they go about their everyday lives by uh, adjusting their, their place to be a sort of home for these arc mixes in different capacities, right? Like you're, you're watching them. There's a shelving unit with everyday objects, much like in the previous instantiation, but then there's also I don't know, something like a, a bouncy castle and a duvet and a, a, a projector screen that has them uh, participate in their lives in surprising ways. Um, and that's mostly what I want to say about the project. And hopefully, I think, I think I can go into more depth on a bunch of these tangents and you can sort of tell me why it's interesting. But I also, before um, closing this, just wanted to point out because of the sort of collaborative nature of the project and its aim to sort of expose multiple kinds of authorships and participation. I, I like to also put the names of everyone that helped out in its various instantiations up, up, up here and their different capacities, whether they're, you know, giving me a crit or actually like a performer or someone that helped me uh, fix up a model or write some code. So uh, I really appreciate everyone that's up here. And I wonder if anyone is actually uh, in the audience uh, can actually see all the names right now. But thank you to all of you that helped. Uh, and I just wanted to also point out maybe some uh, other projects, as I mentioned, right, this was a source for everything that came after. So there was, you know, experiments in AR and making buildings cute, right? Like, how do you think about public uh, that this relates to? And I think, you know, the issue of Twitter is one's way of speaking to a public today. And so, so was also making sort of kawaii stickers. Uh, this recent work that Mark saw that I'm really grateful that he came to visit was a, a desk for sort of working from home coincidentally way before, not way before, but before I anticipated this pandemic hitting North America. Uh, and similarly to the project I sort of just explained, uh, furniture sort of accumulates to make new images um, at this desk. This was collaborative with many people in the shot, but I, I did the screen on the bottom and I think I saw Justin in the crowd here. He was a He's a musician who came and performed uh, at the site of this exhibition. So we were really grateful for his participation, but it's a, it's a reflecting pool, I call it. It sort of captures you and reflects you in a strange way on uh, an imagined body of water. Um, this one is translating image making techniques into physical space. So I think, you know, if I'm to tie all these together, there are some various issues about the ways that the physical and the digital sort of blur in between each other and become both actors. And it's never really one at any one time, but sort of makes the claim that um, images and the web have impacted us culturally in a way that I think architecture should absorb. I'm sure I've left out plenty, but maybe we can catch all of it. No, Thank that's good. Going through that work, I think it's very, very thoughtful. Um, there's so many ideas that come to mind. I'm just going to point out a, uh, a few observations that, as you were talking, that came to my mind. Uh, John Haydick and the idea of architecture as uh, characters or stickers immediately comes to mind. Um, the idea of accessibility and using the internet to bring buildings to people who cannot visit them, especially at this time, is really emerging almost kind of uh, maybe is a new meaning that could be ascribed to the work in this moment. Um, later on, we'll see images from Jenny O'Dell's project, Satellite Collections, and she uh, looks at these huge pieces of architecture seen from space as a visual evidence that humanity was here. And I think your work is doing that by doing the same thing, but presenting it through a different medium or lens uh, which is the internet. 
um, and the impression that it leaves on our mind is no less tangible, I think, than uh, physical artifacts seen in photographs. Um, I also appreciated seeing Lino Bobardi and David Adje and like the kinds of work that kind of lets, uh, gets forgotten by the canonical histories uh, being introduced into this remix, which I think is also goes to the idea of accessibility um, and appreciation. Um, it also says to me how much um, architecture as a profession and as, as an academy has an influence on what gets constructed because many of these buildings, when you distill them through this lens, look so similar, look like part of this, like maybe the same person made them, right? And so we often say, hey, like the client had these constraints and that's why this happened. But we bring a lot of cultural knowledge to projects. So in some ways it's empowering to see, um, you know, how much influence architects have or, or designers have in all of this work that's being constructed. Um, so those are some, some initial thoughts that just jumped to my mind. And I wanna see, Mark, if you had any, any initial, initial reactions. I mean, so mine's of course like less <laughs> specific, um, but just generally, I think my, when I was looking, when you were presenting the work and we had like sort of prepared questions, but my thought was just like, what, what does this do to experience, right? Like when we're looking at things just on the screen, um, it like fundamentally changes how we interface, I think with, with the kind of like built environment or objects of design, right? Like I, I wonder, and I don't think like change is necessarily bad, right? It just, I wonder if it, if it sets up a situation where you're sort of like always disappointed in, in building, like, <laughs> which I think is like something that I experience and like the main reason I question calling myself or, you know, becoming an architect uh, because there's something about the kind of like um, representational space uh, and image making that to me is much more appealing than um, oftentimes the experience of some of these buildings, right? Like I, you know, uh, you get, you get bogged down pretty easily in the kind of like crappy detailing of a, a postmodern building, but the, you know, yellow trace sketch of it, you can kind of imagine multiple realities within it, uh, I think is like where my mind is going. So, I mean, we've thrown a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. I've forgotten everything already. I, I think you bring up so many good points, right? And I think, I want to first say that I, again, I don't, uh, do any of these projects with expectations that you only sort of experience them in a screen like I always hope and I always try to make sure there's a space that goes with it so there's also this other added layer it sort of hopefully draws your attention to the fact that you're seeing something on a screen and that is a sort of native context but I, I mean I do agree with you in the sense that like yeah images are manipulative sort of entities right they they can privilege views for you and, and manipulate your understanding of the built environment in a way that's super controlled and maybe that's why we like uh representation right you can pick the right view you can draw it without the materiality that sucks without with the details that are perfect or removing the sort of constraints that you don't want to leave as evidence so i mean i um i think but i think that yeah and i think that same sort of seductive quality exists within the sort of like installation work you're you're doing too and that i'm 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 not saying like you, like I'm also interested in all these things in a slightly like different um, realm, but I think there's some, there's something about like height, like a sort of like uh, concentrated um, sensorial, it, like visually or experientially things that like a kind of what we'd think of as a, like a traditional building almost can't produce hmm. right like I, I or it's much much harder to kind of like there's just a kind of like intensity to even the you know the colors of the images like the moving the video work the images that are you know flashing in front of you 
the amount of them that like a kind of like I don't know like a a, a high rise or a community center can't necessarily be ever as as oh. just the kind of built architecture part of it. <laughs> I mean, I think those things are a subjective, right? Like the sort of yeah. experience of the tower can for someone be a sort of sublime experience. I, I think what you're trying to identify though is a sort of uh, concentration, right? Uh, in the installation, you only have like a s split second to sort of engage someone potentially. And the same is even, it's a case with an image, but it's even less time you have to sort of capture someone's attention. And so, I mean, I think a lot of the colors are wondering about this tendency, the sort of thumbnailization of, of architecture, right? To be able to sort of uh, process it in a second before it's moved, before you move on to the next, or, or even uh, lure someone in for long enough that they might you know more and, and, and sort of delve into the details. I, I wonder if that is part of the game of the image. And I think, you know, some people try to challenge that by uh, requiring you to spend time with it and appearing otherwise dumb and flat and and uh, and I mean that in the best way possible uh, with an image but then there's so much that is about thumbnail like uh, how much contrast can you produce how clear is a figure how extreme are the colors such that it might be a sort of memorable icon as you move on and I think the the project is uh, doesn't participate in it in the sense that it's excited about uh, that condition, as in that's the condition of image making today, but uh, wonders if there's some efficacy in it and tries to employ some of those techniques. And I think these do become icons in some sense. And I don't know if it's because I've looked at them for too long, but I sort of now think they are real building. I forget. <laughs> They've become new things for me, like or not new things, but they've become familiar things that are as though they were built, maybe. And I think that also happens with, you know, at moments you can see the sources. I don't know if you guys can see any sources in these mashups, but like the Philip Johnson or SOM. Mm -hmm. I mean, in many ways, like if the actual building did not exist, then these iconic uh, representations or icons would not have the same level of um, weight or importance to them. Um, I think their importance is derived from the actual physical location and being of the of the building itself. So, like, it's an image. They, these are images that get lodged into our mind. And it's, to me, it's like branding or like, um, or like uh, a slogan, right? Um, that means so much more. It captures everything else that that represents and it, it gets connected to like whatever is behind it. Uh, but I, I wanna push back on one thing, which is it might be its physical presence and location, but I think it's far more its imageability, right? So many of, uh, these sources that I've collected and we can try, I brought up the list, I actually haven't vis visited the list in forever. So many of the sources are architectural sources uh, that have become icons through their sort of continual photographing, right? And their, your familiarity with it because it represents a place, doesn't necessarily represent an experience you've had with it. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's the source of its recognizability. And I, I think part of the hope with opening this system up for people to use on Twitter is to exactly capture what I think you're highlighting, which is like the baggage of these sources. And so at moments I will play games with the ways that they have uh, been recombined. Uh, disciplinary games, which is to say I can do this because I happen to have some of the knowledge that comes behind it, but also maybe someone that doesn't will find it enjoyable because they might recognize some sources. But for instance, you know, the light gray house might be a, like a sort of joke because we know the baggage of the Van Aventuri house and house, I think five in this case, maybe house four. Um, and, and like putting them next to each other or on top of each other and sort of having them kiss or inhabit one when there is a sort of uh, particular story, but also a strange sort of coupling for those sources. 
And so I think, you know, if we can play games uh, with the sources or even, you know, a lot of what I was looking at when I was doing this was uh, theories about quote unquote post-production or DJing, right? The, the ability to sort of traverse an archive or a body of work in, in your own way as a sort of narrative. And can you sort of, by traversing it, claim some sort of authorship in that despite using things that exist? whether it's a model that someone else made or a building that we're familiar with uh, otherwise, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the other question is about the internet itself. Um, this idea of placelessness or this disappointment that I kind of heard before you mentioning before that it was supposed to be a place of freedom and excitement and it's just something that's a distraction or almost like a drug. And how do we bring back or, or bring to the internet a sense of what, like, I know that you did a workshop that was titled something like, if the internet were a city, what would it look like? And people used like physical modeling to kind of describe that, that place. So what do, you, what do you think about the internet as an architect? And what do you think that, you know, what are, what are the big questions or big ideas in your mind about the internet these days? Yeah, maybe I'm not as critical as my collaborators in the sense that I think the project you're referring to was about the decentralized web. The, the, the desire to uh, find ways of distributing so, uh, access such that control can't be found in the internet. And so one might think of blockchain technologies as a way of doing that, a way of producing quote unquote trust. Um, my immediate interest is far less um, immediately political, it's more about a sort of culture, right? Like what is it, like what do memes mean for architecture? I, I don't know if everyone's seen this sort of uh, building that has emojis sort of uh, beveled into them. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's, I think a terrible translation of this question of culture into architecture or popular culture into architecture. But I think that's what I'm trying to find a way to participate in more than to say, um, these are the ills uh, that I want to combat. And I mean, there are moments of it, right? You know, the sort of ways that we are capitalized on in spaces of network culture. I mean, I think that's problematic. Uh, but the, the the thing you started off with saying is more the sort of, and I think Mark talked about it earlier, uh, the question of a post-digital or post-internet condition, which is to say it's no longer novel, right? Like we can't um, claim it'll save the world, but we can expose... Uh, the way it works, the way we blindly participate in it, uh, and the ways there are like native, strange, beautiful things that I think in many cases are low culture, one might say, um, that can have an impact on the way that we shape space, the way that we share our projects, the way we discuss the relevance uh, of what we do, right? Mm -hmm. So at this point, I'm wondering if we could bring in the Jenny O'Dell project. Mm -hmm. and just kind of insert that into the conversation and see what happens. Um, so I'll share my screen. Sam, do you want, would you want one of your mashups to be built? No, I, as I said, I don't see them as, as sincere proposals. Yeah, I know, but images. you wouldn't at all want that. I'm trying to think if there's one that I particularly like. I, I, there's one that I call the duck because it reminds me of, you know, the duck. Uh, I could see that being on a small scale, but not as like a huge building. I, I yeah. I, I, think, I think that's different than like a lot of, than like, I, I think like Mark Foster Gage would say the opposite or something. Anyways, sorry, we should go to this project real quick. I <laughs> distracted. So this was um, a series of digital prints where Jenny O'Dell goes into Google satellite view and cuts out parking lots, silos, landfills, waste ponds. The view from a satellite is not a human one, she says, nor is it one we were ever really meant to see. But it is precisely from this inhuman point of view that we are able to read our own humanity in all of its tiny repetitive marks upon the face of the earth. From this view, the lines that make up basketball courts and scattered blue rectangles of swimming pools become like aeroglyphs that say, people were here. 
So I'm just going to scroll down and let these images kind of get lodged in your minds as well. These are observatory domes or telescopes. We have landmarks. A lot of these are iconic architecture. We have circular farms. Cargo trains, I love this one. Yeah, it's the shape of those. 100 shipping, shipping containers. Shipping containers. Bulk carriers. Um, wastewater treatment plants. Also. Nuclear cooling towers with the steam or smoke coming out of them. Airplanes, <laughs> fascinating. Um, water slide configurations. Stadiums. Waste and salt ponds. Landfills. Swimming pools. Basketball court in Manhattan. <laughs> Baseball diamond in Manhattan. Almost none of those look like diamonds. Yeah. Um, grain silos, water towers, other cylindrical industrial buildings. The Cabezier would be absolutely thrilled. Empty parking lots. Just gonna keep scrolling now. Oh, that's the last one. All right, so that's what we have. So, um, okay, this is like a so what what do you? I guess like how do you judge or not judge, but how do you categorize that work? It, is it like? um design as a curation is curation design you know like i guess um that's my kind of initial thought is like how do i wrap my head around like what um what to think about the work yeah and i think i wondered about this myself and and i, I sort of have a liberal view of it which is to say i think the act of for instance collecting or composing from existing things is a, like a legitimate form of authorship one uh whether it's you know i don't know what kind of design i think that's a hard one to say but for instance i mean i, I read plans and fields and that work right like this you know stan allen sort of reading of a field or, or even a self-similar version of like a hate of victims collection of things and I think that's fine and I think it's I think the question of design is maybe it's a bit tricky with this because it doesn't have a sort of intended uh, projection of what it might be afterwards but it's there for us to sort of read into it and that's what makes it an artwork yeah and, and the fact that it's like recomposed uh with like you know on a page <laughs> I think but I wonder like how, I guess back to the question of like authorship and like, or just not even authorship, just uh, intentionality or something. Like, do you think that there, and this applies to your work as well. Like, do you care? Do you care what it looks like when, <laughs> when they're put together? Uh like, can it be like for, for Jenny, like, does it matter if it's 101 or 95? Or do you care if it's one building or the other? I mean, every time I assume you produce an image, you, you can talk about it and find something in it interesting. But where is the threshold or something? I don't know. Right. And I think this one. I would like to care. I think in this case, I don't. 
<laughs> I think I care that they're they're numerous and they're moving, and there are people playing with it and people finding something in it. In this case, I think I hope in other images and other projects it's maybe a little more uh, control. But here, the control is a matter of creating a system. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it's creating the system for the images to be made and hopefully for its traces to be evident-ish uh, and then to, yeah, exist and be read and, and talked about hopefully as well. So I think that's difficult, but I think hers has a lot more authorship because maybe um, the space of automation or that moment of automation is in a different place, right? The images she's taking from, those images have been automated, right? They've been captured and stitched together and she's found them and taken them and sort of gone in there and cropped them herself and decided what to put next to what, how. I think the what next to what did not, or like not what next to what, how next to each piece did not work out this project so much. And I think, you know, there could have been another version where I got to focus a lot more on that logics, those logics. And I think um, I have some graphs later on in this presentation I can also show that are wondering about the relationship between parts in a way that's a little more careful. Um, but I'd like to think that even just navigating through these sources that are somehow smashed together, there is some trace of, you know, I like this, I like that. I want these together in a certain way, right? Like the choice to pick. Yeah, like an isometric top. view Yeah. and the colors, those are all like five towers, if you pick five towers, you're gonna get some kind of <laughs> strange tower, right? Like it's a, they're, they're, or again, like the Eisenman and, and Venturi next to each other is a sort of navigation that isn't about design the sense that we're uh, getting to control the logics of adjacency. And, and, and then in some cases I do myself, uh, the earlier tests, but um, yeah, I think I, ideally there would be more room for that carefulness that we, associate with design. Yeah, with, with Jenny's work, what I, what I really appreciate, I guess what I see is this desire to make sense of apparent chaos by identifying the order that is latent within it. And that to the human brain, like when we see patterns, when we see things connecting or like repeating, it like sparks off all these like, um, I don't know, uh, emotions of joy and like, huh, you know, feeling like, yes, it makes sense. Okay. So bringing together those things, I think there's this sense of like, wow, that's amazing. Um, and, 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 it, and it comments on kind of the marks that we're making on the planet and how we might wanna question and rethink that a little bit. And uh, Sam, with your work, I think I do experience something similar, but you're right that the medium itself doesn't allow for that level of adjacency or juxtaposition to be defined or curated. Uh, but there are certain decisions, as you both mentioned, that may give you a certain level of joy as you move from one image to the next and you, and you see this kind of rhythm of forms that are each like, uh, like concise enough to be able to consume very quickly, um, which I really appreciate. And, and it also leads to a lot of questioning and thinking and like analysis of like how we're making this architecture and how could we do it differently. Yeah, there were some, actually, I'm gonna leave it. So uh, tell us a little bit about MIT. How has your relationship with the school been? What do you feel about the architecture school? And what was your experience like studying there? I feel like that would be like super candid, but maybe I would start then with Mark's earlier question about what the climate was like at the moment there. And actually I think, you know, so that was, I was there from like 2013 to 2016 as a student and then 2017 to 2019 teaching. Um, but as a student, I felt like it was a transitionary moment for disciplinary conversations broadly, or trends, I would say, maybe less conversations and more trends or, or tendencies one might see in, in architecture schools. And, and so in that sense, I felt 
kind of in between, kind of in limbo, right? And so I might say that like you, we kind of saw a tail end of a belief in the digital that, you know, uh, prompted fabrication and uh, material research, sort of advocated for complexity and phenomenal effects uh, and some forms of complexity that were advocated for, but really a sort of like absence of what I think of as culture, right? Or history, these sort of uh, other things that might regulate it such that it's not uh, abstract and alienating, but maybe more relatable. And on the other hand, it was sort of uh, a transition to seeing a lot more in school of, you know, pastel drawings and, and a sort of uh, mistranslation of postmodernism and interest in Italy again, right? So I have a sort of faint interest in both, right? Like I feel like I came from this digital space and I felt betrayed by it, right? Like it felt like there was some certain flaws. And then, you know, there was this other thing that no one was teaching me, but, you know, all the young kids were um, suddenly all their projects looked like that, all the ones in the years below me. And so I, I saw this sort of, I think this project was me trying to negotiate that transition in a way, right? Like what is this digital that I grew up with, quote unquote, uh, and, and what does it mean now? And where does it still have potential and where can we leave what it gave us behind? Uh, and also what is this, for instance, what is it, its relationship to history and is there in culture as we experience it in that space online and is there a way to, um, introduce some of that into this space or into the work that we do. Um, as far as what was happening at MIT, I mean, I think there weren't so many conversations about this directly, right? There were some about appropriation and, and thinking about the history of modernism and postmodernism and what it meant to start from scratch for, rather than to continue on something that was started, right? continue a project that was started or in conversation with the project that was started or to reuse things that exist in the world. And I think this really picks up on that, right? And so there's maybe one or two characters that were uh, dealing in that uh, sort of territory. But I think, you know, when I think of the projects from many of my peers at that time, I think they were really ambitious and trying to think of big world problems at certain spots in the globe, not trying to solve the whole problem itself. Um, and we're super responsible in that sense. And I don't feel like my project's all that responsible. <laughs> uh, and then that's maybe where um, it stands out. I think there was maybe one project I can think of that was dealing with the internet and culture, but it was, or maybe there's a few, but they tend to be at the scale of like, you know, what is a data center's presence and another kind of, pro I think we've seen these projects, right? The data center with the plants uh, and, and thinking about the sort of, uh, ge geography of information and um, its experience uh, as storage um, or logistics. And this was trying to think a little bit more about, you know, the immediacy of media and screens and, and the things that we touch and do as a sort of work and, and share as a sort of work, right? Uh, and I will say that I f felt like, you know, you could start to see that a little bit you start to see, you know, a culture of posting at that time. But now, since then, I feel like, you know, architects have really started to treat it as a sort of marketing device, right? Like, there's really so much about self-promotion and it's, um, you know, I want to see more about, or more projects uh, about it. And I think there are definitely some characters out there working on that. Do you think how much about MIT that was at the end, though? <laughs> Yeah. Do you think that architects should design digital spaces or can help with the design of digital spaces? What's a digital space? Like the one we're in right now, um, mm. you know, talking to each other or, you know, there could be an exhibition or there could be um, an experience that goes, I mean, the internet inherently is a two dimensional screen. And so I'm just, I'm just wondering because I wonder if the skills that architects have can be deployed to imagine different kinds of online interactions, or do you think that's futile? And the, I mean, we know that image works. We know from your project that this is you know, something that the dissemination of images, we know the internet is really good at. 
but what about like spatial experiences, whether it's VR or whatever? Should? I don't know if should, but I think, I, I think there are some people doing, and I think, I think a few should. I mean, I think, but hopefully it's the recognizability that that thing also exists in a space as well, right? Like we have this physicality in front of us that we're also interfacing with. So as much as you might interact with a space on screen, we also know that it comes with a space around it. I think that would be um, great. I think the problem and the problem I find that uh, also with my uh, uh, collaboration is that where, it, in which direction does the conversation go? Which is to say, are we making those spaces for the sake of, a kind of architecture and a conversation about that and its histories and its uh, lineages and its conversations? Or, or is it for the sake of a web experience solely, which is to say it's a whole other set of people to talk to that we don't quite know all that much about. And I, I wonder if there's a way to negotiate that. That would be my sort of concern. Um, I do think they have something to contribute for sure. And I mean, I think a lot of what we do is we tell stories through images and uh, we try to communicate the experience of space through images. And that's, so, all, that's always the goal, right? Is yeah. to, or for me, at least, is to like address a sort of larger public audience than the kind of small, insular, academic, disciplinary uh, crew. But to, to get to both of them, I don't know, in terms of like forecasting or seeing the internet i mean i've always had a strange relationship to the internet personally i think because i'm like our family was like late to getting a <laughs> like a computer like i didn't really grow up with the computer and the internet so i'm like the person that types with two fingers um but i see like i feel like in instagram is like fading out it's all about tiktok lately like i've been on in quarantine i've been on tiktok most of my free time um and do you have a tiktok account that we should follow no i haven't started making content yet that's not true i made one video but um i <laughs> a model pardon is it of you making a model no it was just of my parents getting into like a bizarre argument because i thought that that was a good trend to jump on as people <laughs> i'm stuck with my parents right now so i thought it was a particularly interesting um thing but no i think like um I'm curious to see how things go because there's something about TikTok that is much faster and kind of like sloppier and less um, polished. Polished and, but like it's like branded in a different way through like through solely like character or something like that and not necessarily a, a visual. Uh, consistency or aesthetic consistency uh, right so it's it's really like person driven um, and I'm curious to see what that with memes for instance right like it's not about the refinement of the meme to sort of embody you as a sort of perfect subject but instead there's a sort of quick jab that some inconsistency or some irony, right? Uh, and it can be as sloppy and dirty as possible, but ends up also being oftentimes critical in a way that I think you, you I, I, maybe I see that as character in your, your terms. Although on, on TikTok, maybe it's just fun for the most part, but. <laughs> well, no, I think it, it's, it goes from like, you know, it's, it's, deep, it's like weirdly per personal like mm -hmm. it's not always fun there's also like videos of people crying right. or videos of people filming some sort of injustice or like public event you know what i mean there's like a ton of uh, i don't know there, there's just some sort of like immediacy to it and urgency i think which is facilitated by it being videos and short like short videos but it's i don't know anyways it should be um Interesting to see what, what the next generation does with this yeah. of architects. Um, so okay, so we have two segments today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one is the gossip section, and then followed by the lightning round. But I wanted to offer an opportunity for any kind of 
serious points that should be made but have not been made yet. You know, I, I think the thing about this project being a sort of early project is there's so many points that I forget them all. I mean, I think, again, the, the point of this project is to find a space for internet culture in architecture and find ways for architecture to have audiences in ways that we might not have thought about, both our own and others. And the thesis being that images kind of do that and they're problematic and spectacular in some ways and um, we should be skeptical about that, but we should also be aware and have a conversation about that and recognize its tools and manipulations and presence. Uh, and I hope that was clear. Yeah, very, very thought provoking and insightful. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so with that, we'll move to the gossip section. I have in front of me three um, headlines of recent news from the architecture and internet world. And I'm gonna present them to Mark and Sam. And we haven't seen, we don't know what these are also. So just get their reactions on this. Awesome. And you know, none of I've been out of architecture news and the internet up until this week for the sake of this project. So I don't know what I'm missing. <laughs> what happens. Okay, so here is the first one. <laughs> What happened? Oh, I did not know about that. Uh, go back to the headline. Oh, so it's my screen. Sorry, it's my fault. I'm on the weird view. Eva French, E. Gillibert, fired as AA director for, quote, um, specific failures of performance, end quote. I mean, I love the British defensiveness in the article of like, no, we didn't fire you because we didn't like your style. We fired you because of specific failures of performance. Um, well, I mean, she is a Princeton grad and <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, we tend to have a certain reputation sometimes for uh, certain things. I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm saying, but uh, <laughs> I was excited for her move there. I mean, that institution has such an interesting history and it's just, it would be curious. I was curious to see how she would transform it. And it wasn't clear to me how she had been making an impact just yet, but because of her- yeah, pretty of quick. Life, what is it, two uh, years? Two years, I think, right? That's not very much time. No. Uh, but she's such a sort of present and over the top character that I don't know, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe she didn't jive with some of the British formalities. And to me, the irony is, okay, I will say I don't know anything about the difference. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say the irony is that this is a woman in a man's, um, in a profession that's highly, highly dominated by men. And so um, there's this sense that we, a lot of people who may be unhappy with the institution or with the direction of the institution, are uh, speaking out against the main representative in this case. But then also Mark and I have talked about how, you know, just like we say that white supremacy culture can exist even in organizations led by people of color. Uh, similarly, we've seen that the toxic masculinity that sometimes exists and that culture can be embodied by women in leadership positions too, because they've kind of, um, entered this world and made a, a really successful career by like becoming part of that system. So those are just two things that, that come to my mind, but I do want to learn more and, and kind of see what the nuances of this were. So should I go to the next one? Yeah. Yeah. These are awkward. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here is the center for architecture is renaming their biggest party of the year, their biggest fundraiser, which is known as the Heritage Ball. And they are asking the common public to come up with a new name for that. Common public. What is the Center for Architecture? <laughs> well, I need to know what the Center for Architecture is. The AIA New York has a physical space and a okay. gallery and that's the center for architecture and they have programming within New York City. They should rename that their center as well. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just kidding. Jokes. Sorry, AIA. Um, 
from the Heritage Center to something. So what are we supposed to propose there? Heritage uh, Ball to okay. another, another event name. <laughs> Just be like straight up about what it is. It's for money, right? There, it's like a donate. Fundraiser. Yeah. Fu fundraise. <laughs> Large fundraiser. I, I read it as, you know, Heritage <laughs> ha is, is, I'm sure, in some many ways biased. And so I kind of wonder if this is a sort of virtue signaling, signaling to say, okay, maybe this word is problematic. We can open that up, but it's also, you know, incriminating that it had to take this long for something like that to be challenged. I mean, I don't know the particularities of this institution, so it's hard to, for me to make that claim with any sort of sureness, but it's also, I guess, good to, yeah, involve the public more broadly and other opinions and values. So in that sense, it's a positive. We'll see what 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 they come up with. Um, AIA is the same people that do NCARB, right? That's they're all connected. Yeah, I've got a bone connected. to pick with them in the first place. <laughs> Me too. I'm halfway through these exams and I do not like it. Oh. All right, last one. Twitter tweets out an apology after it was hacked. <laughs> this is like a, um, not architecture specific, right? I know, but it's sort of relevant to today's conversation. Like, how can we trust a, I guess we could call it a space or a whatever cloud of stuff that we invest so much time and energy in, but at any moment, it might just disappear with no trace or like be taken over by something else. Like, how do you maintain trust in the internet, Sam? I don't think you can trust any of these sort of characters we talk about, right? Like uh, Twitter is doing plenty of nefarious things with our data that uh, uh, we shouldn't trust them with, right? Uh, I thought you were gonna bring up, I think today they censored a, or took down a, a Trump video tweet some sort. I didn't get to read about it, so I'm not quite sure what happened, but. They put a note on it, like a little. Uh, one of those. Yeah. I mean, after like four years of nonsense. I guess my point being, for the most part, even if they seem like they're doing good, don't trust them. Yeah. Yeah, I don't trust them. But I still like, I mean, I don't have a Twitter, but I, I Thank should. Thank you for yeah. participating in this. And everyone, let us know if you enjoyed the gossip section and whether we should keep it for next time and come with uh, more headlines. <laughs> but now we can move to Mark. <laughs> and <laughs> keep it. <laughs> Andrea, your photo on there is like you with like a slight smile and I keep thinking it's live and that's crack, crack me up. Um, okay, so we're going to do our, our signature <laughs> world-renowned lightning round. Um, uh, so there are either our questions and we're asking our participants to also chat in the chat box your response. So we'll say the question and we'll give a one, two, three, and then you could respond. Okay, so the first question, Sam, you can just respond out loud. Uh, <laughs> it's for everything, I think. <laughs> um, okay, so the first question is side of salad or side of fries? Uh, salad or fries? Okay, one, two, three, salad, or fries, sorry. Of course. Interesting. I'm no, I, I hadn't eaten out uh, for three months. And I got like a little side of fries just fries and a beer and brought it to the house. And every bite was so memorable. <laughs> yeah, I need, I should probably, I, I said salad, but meant fries, but I should be saying salad. I think, <laughs> yeah, it needs, we need, I need to work on my fitness these days. Okay, um, air conditioning or windows down? And this is in reference to a, a car ride. Um, one, two, three. I'd say both. Not good for the environment. Oh, yes. <laughs> are, all your, are all your answers full of guilt, Mark? <laughs> yeah. I operate on guilt. I was raised in an Italian Catholic family. Um, that's my... <laughs> uh, 
I'm out. Okay. Uh, organized or messy? Organized or messy? One, two, three. Let's do messy. <laughs> I think uh this speaks numbers <laughs> organization is almost subjective right <laughs> or like messiness is a form of organization that's that can be argued yes is it i would love to hear more about that because i need to start telling that to my sorry even if it's library. messy I think. my mind is messy i I, I, I i lack organization um okay uh bolded or underlined bolded is bolded a word bold or underlined one two three underlined, underlined. sam you said underlined as well underlined. yeah Why do you say that it's a line lines are interesting <laughs> i don't know i i guess i said it because um sometimes it changes the size of the like line spacing but i probably just don't know enough about like illustrator and design and i'm sure you could avoid that but it frustrates me so it's easier sometimes to just underline it um okay uh lost or found lost or found uh one two three uh lost I guess I, I don't have an opinion about this one. What does everyone else say? Yeah, we need a Isa and a Jackie. What found? In the context of pets. <laughs> In the context of pet. Oh, got it, got it. Was that what everybody was going off of? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Good. Jackie responding for everybody um okay and then the last one is uh beer or mixed drink beer or mixed drink one two three mixed drink actually i probably would say beer i had a few mixed drinks the other night and i'm regretting it are you drinking a mixed drink right now oh you're drinking a beer what class is yeah i was or you were <laughs> Um, what's your favorite mixed drink? And then we'll end the show. This is... <laughs> Me? Yeah. Well, I said beer, but uh, I'd say uh, I like Tom Collins a lot. It's just like lemony, uh, but not sweet. Dry. I don't even know what that is. It's soda, gin, lemon, and sometimes simple syrup. I don't put the simple syrup, but for the summer, it's a pretty refreshing drink. Not too that sounds delicious. Justin agrees. <laughs> um, I was drinking, uh, I forget what they're called. It's like grapefruit juice and lime juice and tequila. Anyways, highly recommend with some ice for a good summer drink. Anyways, thus concludes Foil <laughs> Architecture Chats uh, featuring... Sam, um, no, I'm kidding. Thank you so much for, for joining. This was interesting. And I, we never got to talk too much about um, your work. So I'm excited to, to hear more about it and see what, you're, what you do next. Keep it going. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you all for coming. And special shout outs to Maya and Justin, good friends um, and kind of collaborators in some capacity. And uh, thanks, Mark and Lucas. I'm curious to see who you'll bring next. <laughs> we Thank are you so much, Sam. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for joining. It was yeah. just fun. Have a good Be weekend. Safe. Good weekend. Yeah, well. Enjoy your rest of your Sunday. Cheers. Bye. See you. Bye, Isa. Thanks for coming. <laughs>